Greetings and welcome to the Mount Rushmore Podcast. My name is Jeff and I'm joined as always by my good buddies Richard. Hello. And Michael. Howdy. Richard and Michael, they go at each other debating the most ubiquitous aspects of a variety of topics and this time around... Oh, this is a hot topic, but ironically, it's very cool. It's the Mount Rushmore of cool. And this was whose? This was mine. Cool. And uh, <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Cool. I, came, I was, there were certain people, I, I started thinking about how there were, there are famous people and then there's cool people. Okay. And cool people can be famous, but you don't necessarily have to be famous to be cool Mm. cool just sort of like stands apart from everything else yeah like there are a lot of famous people but not all famous people are cool like i don't think there's anything cool about tom cruise he seems like a big ass (laughs) dork beyond all of the uh Uh scientology stuff which doesn't help yeah but there are there are certain celebrities or they're even and that that just kind of got me thinking about like aspects of cool So mine's kind of a mix of people who are cool and then certain things or aspects of things that are cool. I love it. I think these topics are some of the most fun ones where they're not so prescribed. Like if it was basketball, you know, we we know, we know Michael Jordan's going to be on that list, but this is kind of generic. So, um, okay, cool. Let's start with cool. Michael, what's your first cool? Uh, My first cool is definitely, um, I I guess they, it feels like they, kind of slam dunk pick. I mean, not, they're not a basketball player, uh, but Arthur Fonzarelli from, um, (laughs) (laughs) if there's anyone that has kind of just like defined like a general vague coolness for like at least our generation or maybe even the generation before ours and maybe it, you know, a kind of weird, creepy guy that (laughs) lives upstairs behind the, teenager's house isn't that cool anymore i think we can all relate to it being kind of weird creepy guys but he you know he was like everyone just he was just acknowledged as the coolest person within the kind of the happy days uh world and um i think that everything about him just like being like this kind of kind of greaser but was stood up for the little guys got all the girls uh or a leather jacket, rode a motorcycle. He was just like, continues to be, I think just like when you're just kind of like doing like a little check box of like, what is cool in a person, you know, very self-confident, very, um, I don't know, can do that rush, that weird Russian dance, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you got to have a lot of confidence, just be able like when everyone's dancing to like, I don't know, you know, you know, rock around the clock yeah. and then you can just come out and dance like, you know, like a... the Matrochka, <laughs> the, the Cossack dance. <laughs> like, I don't know, he's just, he's just a cool str- guy. The strong Cossack population of Milwaukee at the time. I think. <laughs> I, I think the other thing that really made me think about this was like, I was thinking of like just cool movies in general and like, um, like Pulp Fiction is like undoubtedly just like one of the coolest movies. And there's a scene in the diner when like, Samuel L. Jackson's uh, Jules Winfield is holding a gun or, or the uh, honey bunny is holding a gun to Jules Winfield. And he tells her to, you know, be cool. And like the person that they point to, to be cool is be cool. Like Fonzie. And, oh like, yeah. We can all be Fonzies. We can all just be cool like this. Then we'll get out of the situation. You're not going to get killed. Just give me my wallet back. I don't care about the money. You know, you can take all the money just, but everybody, everybody in that diner, even the foreigners, recognize that Fonzie is like the coolest one or the epitome of cool. And I think that kind of clinched yeah. it for me. I, th- I think also knowing, um, I love, you know, uh, behind the scenes stuff and TV stuff and knowing that Henry, Henry Winkler, in a way it's kind of like uh, the emergence of Superman as the all this all American heroic figure, but being authored by two Jewish uh probably first generation Americans or mm, second yeah. um, who were on the fringe and who were not, uh, who, who were globally persecuted. Uh, so knowing that Henry Winkler is a, a, a dyslexic um, Jewish <laughs> American who uh, um, you know, studied Shakespeare and 
and all that kind of stuff for him to emerge as this kind of greaser archetype in the show and become this cool uh, icon is really fascinating. So, so it's almost like the, the force of will that it took to make that character uh, cool almost comes, comes from this um, definitely kind of outsider type of persona. And maybe that makes it even cooler <laughs> that, that it's, that it's all um, force of charisma and, and whatnot. I also found it interesting that they, they, they kept trying, at least in the later seasons. Obviously, the show sort of turned into his show once uh, Ron Howard left. It became, slowly became like the Fonzie show, plus, yeah. you know, Joni and Chachi and whatever. Ralph Mouth still sticking around somehow. Mm-hmm. But um, <laughs> even, even as he, con- con- you know, kind of continued to go into less cool things, he, they tried to make him the cool version of like, he was like, became like a cool teacher. Like yeah. nobody like who cares about a teacher but like it's like okay well Fonzie's a teacher so he's got to be cool and uh-huh. even in like his like i guess his last kind of most defining moment of jumping the shark in the dorkiest way possible wearing shorts and that little life vest around his waist he was still wearing a leather jacket and they still treated him as if it was <laughs> yeah. the coolest thing in the world even though it was like are, are you kidding me he jumped over like a ringed off bit of the ocean that i apparently had a yeah. shark in. <laughs> like i don't know I guess in the first, I don't know if it's the first season or at least the first few episodes, he was not allowed to wear a leather jacket because mm. ABC or somebody didn't want to um, um, support that kind of uh, um, <laughs> uh, delinquent uh, dr- dress. So Jeff, is is yeah, isn't the story that that that's why he would ride the motorcycle like into the house or into the restaurant, oh, yeah. the diner? Was because I think I believe he was told you can only wear the jack you, you can only have him in the leather jacket if he's riding a motorcycle. Yeah. Mm. So that's protective. yeah. He yeah, because then it's gear. it's just safe. <laughs> and so that's why he rides the motorcycle in everywhere because that way he's on his in his yeah, leathers. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so it's almost like uh, I think he was wearing corduroys and a windbreaker. But still, he was the coolest guy just through his <laughs> sheer force of awesomeness. And of course, he played that greaser in um, Kings of... Oh, I forget what the movie... I, he had played that greaser before. I um, wish I could remember the name of the movie now. Uh, cool first choice. <laughs> uh, Richard, what do you got? All right. So my first choice is probably the first thing I thought of when I just thought about cool things and signifiers about people who are cool. And my first choice is Ray-Ban sunglasses. Oh, Ooh. awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I know when I was a kid, when I was able to save up enough money and get some of my parents to throw in a little bit, and I was able to get a pair of Ray-Ban sunglasses, man, I thought I was the shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then, no, they got bro- then they got broken about a month later. But that's not important. That's less yeah, cool. That's less cool. But the, the, that month that I had the Ray-Bans, I was like freak. I was like freaking Lou Reed out. That was the Lou Reed of Central California. <laughs> were other people wanting to wear your sunglasses at that point, like because they were so cool? Yeah. Okay. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. I sort of remember that actually. No, I. It was definitely you know in the early nineties, mm-hmm. the Ray Bans had made a big comeback. Yeah, for sure. And we, I'm I'm thinking the first time. I might have seen them would be Jake and Elwood on SNL and then seeing them wear them in Blues Brothers and and uh, all the other different places they might have popped up. Um, on Snoopy as Snoopy. Joe Cool. <laughs> yeah. Now, didn't he have like the circle glasses? I don't know. I was just trying to make a Snoopy joke. <laughs> oh, you son of a bitch. It was definitely cool. Did you, Jimmy Dean Chester wear them? Cheetah. I'm sure Chester Cheetah wore Ray, Bland, Ray Bans. Yes, Ray Bans. Chester sort of Cheetah is a good animal. joke. Any sort of cartoon animal. Now I think of uh, Jack Nicholson as wearing them. I don't know mm. what, what film he might have, but uh, for sure. There's something about the arc- architecture of that frame, that spotlight type of frame that we see. The, even like the Henry Winkler evolving into... Uh, um, the Fonz, those frames seem to kind of evolve out of the, um, what the military might call BCDs, you know, <laughs> like the, yeah. the, the really kind of dorky Buddy Holly looking standard issue, uh, glasses. Um, so the, it's almost like they emerged out of, uh, this kind of standard issue 
dorkiness and then you put some dark frames in them and all of a sudden you're the coolest guy around. Yeah, I mean, it's very specifically those, the way, uh, you know, the the super, I mean, I know yeah. Ray-Ban makes a wide variety of sunglasses, but it's the, yeah. with the Wayfarers, I yeah. guess is what I'm thinking of, yeah. specifically. I mean, there's something about that that's just sort of like, they're dark, you know, they, they're they classic looking, you know, anyone, it, it makes anyone look better. Yeah, there was a doc about, I'm a Beatles fan, I think they're, probably are, are some of our listeners. There was a doc about the early Beatles performing in Germany and Stuart Sutcliffe was the bass player back then. And uh, he wasn't very good at bass, but they picked him because he looked cool all the time. <laughs> and so he would come out on stage and he looked like James Dean and he's playing just the most rudimentary bass lick, but wearing those Ray-Ban sunglasses. And everybody in the audience assumed he was the leader of the band. Um, then fuck it, John and Paul come out wearing black leather. <laughs> And playing, playing, you make me dizzy, Miss Lizzie, or some other Chuck Berry song, and just they were an unstoppable force. But yeah, cool. Uh, <laughs> Winfield, what's your second cool? Uh, my second choice, and I probably talked about her before, but I don't care. I'll do it again. Uh, Karen O from um, the Yeah Yeah Yeahs. Oh, yeah. I was trying yeah. to think of just like the coolest things that I've ever experienced, like in concert or musically, and. Um, I think when I first and the only time I saw her in concert, um, way back in like 2002, no, 2003, something like that, here's this, uh, just this immensely confident uh, rocker chick on stage. And she was just like, she was singing a song called Art Star and she had the entire microphone like head in her mouth and she was just screaming. And I remember being like, wow, she is my age. Like, I think we're born the same year. And, like, she is – I'm never going to co- do anything as uh, cool as, like, this sort of performance. And I think that there is something about rock stars that it's the confidence. Uh, you know, I was thinking of other rock stars, too. Just – it doesn't matter how kind of grisly looking you are. The, just the – and certainly Karen O is not – grizzly looking <laughs> i was gonna say that was uh a... i i was thinking of like i uh, got someone else that i think is cool is like um guy what's his name from pulp uh jarvis cocker jarvis cocker is just like a, a gruesome looking person but he just exudes like this confidence and whatever it is that makes um rock and roll um front people have the ability to like shed everything every insecurity and be up on stage in front of you know hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of people and just kind of own the spotlight and just when i think of the person that i think is just the fucking coolest i think it's definitely her as just like wow she just she just commands a stage and i think that there in terms of being cool i i think that there's just so much um power and maybe she's a mess of a person off stage i don't know you know, entirely possible. Most of us, most of us are, but mm-hmm. like, um, I don't know. I just think, man, it's just whatever that is about rock and roll and uh, being a front person just automatically makes you just so, so cool. And yeah, yeah, I also, I also went with a front woman for my second pick. Okay. I went with Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth. Yeah. Okay. Great. Quite literally cool thing. <laughs> um, she was somebody who just, you know, being, you know, growing up and, in, 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 you know, being, you know, 15, 16, 17, that just seemed like that band was the epitome of like kind of this New York cool vibe. And I think a lot of it has to do with the attitude of not giving a shit. Yeah. I mean, I think that you mentioned that with, you mentioned with Karen O kind of having the presence and kind of commanding the stage. And the attitude that you have to have for that and sort of the mental place you need to be in. And it has, you have to make sure it doesn't come off like if if it's forced, it's not cool. If it seems like that you're putting on a front, it's not cool. So there, there, there's some element of being cool where it has to feel like it's just this natural organic thing. And you don't really care about being cool. Like you're not styling yourself to be cool. These are just the clothes that you're wearing and Hey, they happen to be cool. Hmm. And this is the music that I make. And you know, it just happens to be the music that I make. And is this cool music? Yeah, absolutely. Is a hipster kind of music. Sure. I'm always, I'm always impressed by 
those uh, musicians that go on stage, you know, they, they fall into such different categories. Like some are the ones that are mm, like Madonna, who definitely there is more of a um, performance outfit change. You're kind of the music you're, the song you're singing is to a specific set of um, looks and choreography and whatever. And then there's like a musician that literally seems like they got out of bed and put on a t-shirt and corduroys and went on stage and they just like they were still cool nonetheless in spite of like it didn't it just didn't matter like all all that uh, insecurity about like oh making sure you're dressed the rock and roll part it was just kind of gets you know falls away as they're just up there with a guitar or whatever just they're just like oh yeah they're just there in like a t-shirt and jeans yeah have we talked about that kind of the formula like is it is it not caring is it you know i just think like you know when morrissey would get on stage and then put on a fake hearing aid <laughs> so he would look like wounded and disabled or 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 just trying to make himself look not like a posturing rock star it almost seems like he even more was posturing but still he was cool well he was always posturing i mean, yeah. I, mean like, yeah. I think that he always had a uh, certainly a a very deliberate sense of his particular look uh-huh. and stardom and tried to ape stuff that came out of movies that he loved from like you know the 50s and 60s mm-hmm. and it was just like oh i'm i'm gonna be this person now and whether you know who i am or not it doesn't matter it's yeah it's that's i think that's part of his. I think somebody like sting who mm-hmm. maybe back in the day i don't know i always thought andy summer was cool i never thought sting was cool it almost felt like he was trying to be sexy versus yeah cool so I'm trying oh, to think of who is who is probably the most popular, uncoolest, but tries to look cool. It's probably Bono, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> Bono's definitely like out there. Yeah. You know, he's usually in high heel boots and leather jacket and hair slicked back and mm-hmm. a cowboy hat and a yeah, b- big glasses and like he. I think he tries to look as cool as yeah. possible, but you know, who knows? Well, I think in the Who, uh, mm. um. Pete Townsend and Keith Moon were cool because they were just lost in playing the music. And it seems like uh, John Entwistle was cool because he didn't even look like he wanted to be there. <laughs> he right. Like he, maybe he was yeah. Playing under protest, yeah, totally. basically. But then Roger Daltrey was just kind of this swaggering, probably really sexy to the crowd. But uh, I don't know if that was cool. It was something different, whatever it was. It was something yeah. Different uh okay 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 um so i think i think we're at halftime. our halftime yeah, yeah maybe. and uh this point we're gonna let everybody know that this uh mount rushmore podcast is now by coastal uh, we are nationwide we are covering <laughs> the content <laughs> of north america we have richard posted uh, uh right in uh, kansas city missouri that's right yes. Jeffrey, ironically not posted there for whatever <laughs> reason just weird <laughs> Um, but we, we've got you covered, uh, the Mount Rushmore podcast does. So yeah, uh, Jeff is in Florida and he is currently being eaten by an alligator I'm, as we speak. I'm being slowly perpetually dis- <laughs> slowly dissolved. I see a beer can in here. Uh, there's a hypodermic needle. Um, <laughs> no, I was thinking more just like every day you get eaten by an alligator and then the oh, day yeah. starts again, like Prometheus, basically. <laughs> yeah. You're like, if Prometheus was a Florida man, that'd be you. That's right. Uh, but we still want you to know that uh, um, you, you know, if we can be so many places and do this podcast, then you can be part of it, not just uh, by suggesting a cool topic for us to discuss or uh, letting us know um, uh, suggestions for any topic we discuss, but actually joining us in the podcast. Past folks who have uh, contributed a topic have been on the podcast via the magic of Zoom. So that is an option. Uh, but we would like to hear your suggestions out there on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. That would be super cool. So we can uh, expand our purview even farther to be broadcasting from your house as well. Uh, and now we're going to go and uh, Michael's going to let us know. Cool number three. Cool number three. Um, Trey Cool. First... <laughs> Trey, Trey Cool from... <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs>
Uh, you uh, nailed it, Jeff. Good job. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> this uh, is me. The, the, the tearing sound is me ripping my arm off to pat myself on the back. <laughs> <laughs> the, Sorry, Michael. Um, go ahead. The icy bear. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> He's so cool. <laughs> Uh, cool spot. I'm um, no, obviously no. another one wearing sun- sunglasses. That's yeah. all you need to do. You just need to slap some uh, dark sunglasses on a anthropomorphic um, yeah. red dot, and apparently uh, you're going to get a Sega Genesis game out of it somehow. <laughs> oh, what a terrible game! Oh, uh, what a terrible sure, game! I'm pretty sure either I owned it or I had rented it from my local uh, 2020 video or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool spot. Uh, no, uh, I started uh, Ferris Bueller. It was like oh, uh, yeah. from the 80s. There was an element of him as a character um, from the movie. I don't know if I ever uh, saw the kind of beleaguered um, TV series that I think they tried to do. Oh. Um, or kind of the... Um, but Ferris Bueller is one of those characters where that was, you know, uh, everyone... Th- except for a very small handful, obviously his family thought he was the coolest person in the world. Yeah. Um, he was, he had this, uh, in the movie, he had kind of this magical ability to get anybody to go along with whatever um, plans he had. And I think he did it in a way that was um, just very persuasive because of, mostly because of um, uh, Matthew Broderick's kind of, kind of hang dog, puppy dog, young kid face look. Um, pleading, but then he could also be very like, I don't know, uh, strangely aggressive for for that as well with um with his best friend uh, Cameron, who you know, I think he was just one of those guys that uh, could get people to go along with everything, and um, you know, kind of work the system in his own way. That didn't seem mm, too terrible. Eh, kind of skirted the law quite a bit, but I think there was obviously a, a sense of coolness in that i mean if you're Mm -hmm. if you're cool enough to get on stage on some sort of um i don't know german parade in downtown chicago singing donka (laughs) shane you're doing pretty good did you feel like he was crafted by we know that he was he he joined molly ringwald and um judd nelson and Mm -hmm. all these characters in terms of being adult creations uh, adult imagining what children are like or what teenagers are like or kind of idealized way, which is always what Hollywood has always been or television has always been, was gr- growing up making these um, carefully curated kids. And there was something about Ferris Bueller that seemed almost like a, almost like a Sinatra Rat Pack throwback in the form of a suburban goofy kid. Like if you took a, uh, Jerry Lewis and Frank Sinatra and, and Dean Martin and rolled them in with a mm. little bit of Danny Kaye or Jerry Lewis or, uh, you know, you would almost get who Ferris Bueller was. So for me, he was a cool kid, but he was, he wasn't really a kid. You know, he was this kind of adult creation. He was an old soul. An old soul. Yeah. That's interesting. But definitely a lot of fun things that I could identify with as a, as a, uh, that I would like as a young person, because other cool people on TV and film at that time were athletes or just rock stars. They were never the, there weren't always the funny guy, which Ferris was for sure. You know? I think, I think there was a, I think he was definitely a character too, that kind of, um, he made the most out of his situation. Like, you know, he complained that he didn't get a car, but he got like a really nice computer. Yeah. And then he figured out a way to make the computer work for him and, that oh, yeah. was cool in a way that like computers weren't supposed to be for like, you know, his previous computer character personage was uh, from uh, not Project X. What's the other one? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, War games. War games. War games, where he was just this huge Uber nerd. And then suddenly this huge Uber nerd, Uber nerd turns into uh, like the cool kid wearing the vest. And he's like just changing his grades to like passable B pluses. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, oh, that's what that's what like the, the rowdy cool kid does. That's not what like the, you know, the. Matthew Broderick as kid, uh, maybe also changing grades. I don't know, getting yeah. test scores or you know, accidentally almost nuking the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. There's this. There's. Uh, I think again, it comes down to a 
uh, all my picks tend to have like a kind of a confidence thing. And I think maybe confidence is just like the secret underlying what is the thing that makes somebody so cool. And it is, mm-hmm. They know who they are and the world revolves around that, so to speak. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mr. Manfred. All right, my third choice. Joe Willie Namath. Oh, wow. Otherwise known as Broadway Joe. Joe. Broadway Joe. <laughs> Otherwise known as the guy in The Simpsons who warns you about vapor lock. <laughs> no, I... Joe Namath was just... He was maybe the original cool athlete. Or at mm-hmm. least he may have been the coolest athlete of all time. Yeah. I mean, predicting that you're going to win a Super Bowl and guaranteeing it before the game. Okay. That's pretty cool. Now, since you're broadcasting from Kansas City, what about yes. Lenny the Cool? Well, there's Lenny the Cool who predated the cool of, of Namath, right? So Lynn Dawson? He, well, I do appreciate that Lynn Dawson would like would have a cigarette at halftime. Yeah. yeah. There's a, a cool. really famous what photo. He cools. <laughs> cools, yes. There's a famous picture of him like at a halftime of a game, and they're giving the going over the excess snows, and he's just sitting there at his locker yeah. having a drag. Yeah, if he's That's, if he's if he's got to run, he, we're in trouble. <laughs> yes, yeah. no cardio for him, please. <laughs> but yeah, I mean Joe Namath, calling your shot—that's cool. Mm-hmm. Being a white guy in the '60s wearing a full-length fur coat and pulling it off—yeah, that's cool. Yeah, uh, opening up your own, uh, swinging. Uh, bar and, and, and nightclub called Bachelors 3 and, ma- and turning that into the hottest hot spot in New York for a time being. You still see athletes today running their own nightclubs. <laughs> I mean, it does seem like, it seems like more like a sitcom setup than something that would happen yeah. in real life, you know, but here we are. I do think I saw him in a movie at the drive-in, like CC Rider or something like, he, you know, and yeah. he had become a movie star, I think, for a while there. Yeah, he did a lot of like spaghetti western type stuff. Mm-hmm. And like was he in Mother Jugs and Speed? <laughs> Possibly. Oh well, uh um yeah, that was the cause and um Harvey Keitel and Rex oh, Har- Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. It was CC Ryder or something like that. Yeah. Um was yeah. the one with him. But yeah, he he was able to parlay his football success into uh, uh something of a movie career. Yeah. And he was just, he just exude. He was, I read a really great autobiography, not autobiography, great biography of him a few years ago. And it just sort of highlights how he was somebody who, you know, the cliche is women want him and the men want to be him. He was that guy. Yeah. You know, he was the football hero, but he was also somebody who the, who, who the female fans could get into for other reasons mm-hmm. because he just sort of, exuded confidence and cool and swagger yeah do you think he was also one of those football players that being a football player i've heard that it's hard for these guys to have like these big personalities because you know when they're on the field they're wearing basically mat you know they're wearing masks and face guards over their faces so you don't really see them when they're on tv as opposed to like a basketball player or baseball player but at the same time you know when he was playing in the NFL, there was maybe, what, 20 teams? I don't know. Something like that, yeah. Let's say there were 20 teams. So there were 20 starting football players. Who was his main, like, who were the main people, who were the main quarterbacks he was playing against? So you're always compared to, like, someone in, like, your peer group. Like, was, like, was Roger Starbuck, was he, like, a good looking guy or does he kind of like a, did he kind of have like a meat packers face or something? You know, like, I'm, I'm wondering if, like, like, you know, these all American yeah. quarterbacks as we've come to know them to know them well that, was, like a, that was abe simpson simpson's um uh kind of comparison was uh not you know the the flowing hair of joe namath uh uh was less preferred to jo- johnny unitas there's there's a guy who with a flat top you can set your watch to <laughs> yeah i was just gonna yeah. say that yeah when you look at super bowl three the famous super bowl that's the the, the quarterback comparison is Broadway Joe Namath versus square middle America, Johnny Unitas. And so, yeah, it was a cult. It was a sign of the cultural shift that was happening you know, more broadly in, in the United States. I mean, you know, he had sideburns 
and he had kind of longish hair and he wore dressed flamboyantly and he wasn't afraid to uh, be in the New York tabloids for who he was dating. And it was just totally different than anybody else. And yeah, I think it, I think you're right, Michael. I think in comparison to the other quarterbacks who were playing at the time, he was, you know, the first star quarterback for reasons that went beyond just what he did on the field. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Well, it's fun to have an athlete in there. So, uh, what's your final one, Michael Winfield? Oh, yeah, I can't. I can't hear him. Can you? No. Holding. 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 Oh, so Richard, do you want to download, like, you can send me a link to the files or something afterwards? Yeah, I can, I, I can either download the files or I can give you the login to the app and then you can just download them yourself oh. into, onto your computer. Okay, well, whatever way. That's probably going to be the, that's probably the easiest so I don't have to send files to you. Okay. Man, this lighting. I didn't know I had this ridge. This, this two-inch ridge in my ah. You do look a little unfrozen caveman lawyer. I'm just a simple caveman. I don't understand this podcasting. Why is it a pod? And why are you casting it? What an amazing nuanced character. Because he was truly an asshole wasn't he? he was kind of covering up like it was all a, a facade like he's he, he unfrozen cape and lawyer could could function just fine in, in society yeah he was like pretending to be unfamiliar with all this <laughs> what have you Hold seen on. this was i think on the okay i hear you now here. michael hello can you hear me out of this microphone H- tap the mic it's not no. that one back here i think it's just a regular talking i think it's okay. just a regular now we can't hear you oh that's weird whatever you just did turns you off me too i know it turned everybody off frankly <laughs> don't nope. hear you any yeah. there there we go there that better yes that's yes oh, a doodle do We'll figure it out. Yeah. Fix it in post. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just press the Zencaster fix it in post button and then we'll be fine. Yes, it's so easy. Any, any, even a child can do it. Okay. All right, Winfield, what's your last, the final cool? This has got to be uh, cold, ice cold. <laughs> it's got to be cooler than cool. Boy, you know. <laughs> it's stone cold Steve Austin. Uh, it, you you kind of hinted at it earlier, uh, Jeff when you mentioned uh, someone that was created kind of corporately and I, um, I, it just came to me. Uh, His name's Poochie D and he rocks the telly. He's half, (laughs) he's half Joe Camel and a third uh, Fonzarelli. He's a Kung Fu hippie from gangsta city. I'm a rapping surfer. You're the fool I pity. Uh, Poochie from the Simpsons, a man, a completely manufactured joke of a character um, that was, built by ad wizards to be to kind of uh, appeal to uh, everyone and ultimately appealing to no one and i thought <laughs> what that's just what some people are trying to capture the zeitgeist of what they think cool is and um i think that is just that is just hollywood that is advertising that is music whether it's some sort of like um kind of boy band or whether it's just like trying to uh get in on whatever is in the now, you know, I keep thinking of like JC Penny catalogs that would like post, like, this is what, this is the new grunge look. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no one's going to JC Penny to figure out what grunge is. <laughs> yeah. Right. The people that are, the people that are in the scene are wearing flannels because they're poor. And they're, wearing, <laughs> they're wearing corduroys because they're getting it from like a, uh, you know, secondhand clothes shops. And Poochie was just this character that had a flannel shirt on his hat mm-hmm. backwards. Uh, had a created, skateboard. <laughs> had a skateboard. 
and tried to just pick up all these different things that someone or a group of someone's thought was um, cool and um, just wasn't in any way. And I thought, boy, there's an aspect of being cool, which is like defining the exact uh, opposite. You know, I thought of like Fonzie being try you know eventually becoming like this dorky <laughs> dorky teacher and then <laughs> i don't know poochie just never cool now was, wanting, was but desperately wanting to be cool was poochie uh created in an attempt to uh get better ratings for itchy and scratchy is that who yes who he is for? okay yeah the yeah. the um the writers just determined or the the ad people determined that the logical order is a you know a mouse cat dog so you know. <laughs> and then the name of course just came out with like lazy writers <laughs> not wanting to do anything past it. You're like what do I, I don't know think of a good name like uh, poochie or something you come up with something it's like, oh, uh-huh. poochie you're fine with that yeah <laughs> my favorite is poochie's i think i've used poochie's exit line a few times <laughs> i've got to go back to my planet now yeah. <laughs> like, oh my god <laughs> oh it's so funny <laughs> Now, um, is this a I- ironic choice? Because sure, how about okay. that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's uh, the calculated. If if uh, uh, if Frank and if Doctor Frankenstein had cobbled together <laughs> an ill-fated soon uh, soul that will live a frustrated, horrible, loveless life, <laughs> Pooch and I. I- I think to your point, Michael, I mean, it does go back to the thing that we said earlier, that when you try too hard, you're no longer, you're not cool. Yeah. And Poochie is the definition of trying too hard. Is literally, you know, focus grouped, you know, ad wizarded um, <laughs> mm-hmm. character. But it's just so, and it's just so desperate for you to like him. And of course, you're yeah. not going to because kids can see through that right away. Yeah. Right. For me, for me, Poochie was, uh, when I first saw him, I remember thinking if it was a, an amalgam of, of the uh, Cousin Oliver characters that have been introduced in a lot of different um, programs, and we've discussed that, I think, in another podcast. But it seemed like the bones of Poochie was Scrappy-Doo, uh, this annoying dog that I could almost feel like other characters in an animated uh, show of Scooby Doo, we're actually doing a take to the camera, and like, can you believe this shit? <laughs> I felt, I felt like uh, um, Shaggy was just looking at the camera, going, "Oh my fucking god, <laughs> I can't believe I have to deal with this." Okay, uh, uh, finish it off, and then we'll cool it. We'll cool it. My, I'm la- not my last choice. I started thinking about connective tissues to my choices, and I mentioned with the Ray Bands, I mentioned the Velvet Underground. And kind of them being one of the seminal bands that I picture when I picture Ray Bands, when I picture cool sun, cool dark sunglasses. And then we talked about, you know, Kim Gordon from New York. Uh, Joe Namath played in New York. Velvet Underground were a New York band. Even going to Michael's choices, so it wasn't. Aren't the Yeah Yeah Yeahs a New York band? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So my last choice is the city of New York. Okay as kind of the arbiter of what is cool. Certainly when I was growing up, you know, I'd been to Los Angeles several times growing up as a kid and coming down to, eh, when I'd stay with my sister and we'd go down for a, for a weekend or for a night to go do some stuff. And like Los Angeles was great and it was a big city and it was certainly different than what I was growing up in. But New York felt like something different that's like where Andy Warhol is. You expect, I half, you know, I would half expect to see Andy Warhol just walking down a street in my mind. That's what I pictured New York was like, like you're literally just running into the coolest people in the world, just mm. hanging out everywhere. And as, yeah. And as I got older, you know, so much of what is cool does come from New York. I mean, I hate to, I, you know, I'm a proud Angelino. And I'll, I'll, I'll defend the city over New York until the day I die. But New York is inherently a cooler city than Los Angeles in terms of that kind of cool element to it. I don't think it's not a better city, but in terms of cool, I think it definitely has the advantage there. Mm-hmm. 
Well, it, uh, it kind of goes back to that um, bravado, confidence thing, like the city that will eat you up and you've got to be tough and strong and you live on top of each other. Los Angeles is a movie that everyone tries to move to and then they're just like, and LA's like, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Like, we're uh, whatever, sure. New York's like, oh, you got to be really tough to move here. And then you're like, ah, uh, LA's like, all right, no, you moved to LA. That's cool too. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, it, it's it's a little bit sure, more of a pa- yeah, it's a little more passive in its reception to people, um, and you know you just think like the you know art scene and fashion and all of these different music and how much of what we consider to be cool in those scenes came from New York. I don't know. I just think New York is having been there several times myself. It kind of lives up to the hype. I know someone told me one time, you know, everyone should, everyone should live in New York for a year, mm-hmm. but there's no need for you to live there longer than a year because once you've lived there for a year, you've kind of got it, and you've kind of done it, and then you can move to some place that's more livable. Mm. But for one year, being in New York is such a cool thing mm-hmm. to get to do. It does seem the, the some of the choices of persons that we've some of some of your choices were persons who are often cool kind of perceived to be cool but how, because how they're dealing with um uh personal challenges or dealing with the stress like joe namath um there's a picture of him i don't know if it's if he's if it's halftime he's talking to a coach or if it's after the game was won and he's talking to the president or something like that but he's covered in mud and he's yeah. like a gladiator and uh, I think of Kim Gordon, think of like punk bands or, uh, you know, post-punk bands and how they may be on stage and sweating and in the spotlight, but they're still succeeding. Um, and it seems like New York is just going somewhere you're going to get beat up every day and and making it and then in that crucible of of challenge and pitting yourself against other persons who are striving striving there too it does seem like it's a a badge of courage if you can survive you have to be kind of pretty cool to survive there so yeah yeah it's interesting um okay dudes uh let's go with the ladies uh let's go with karen and kim because uh ladies are cool and (laughs) let's go with um come on let's go poochie I want to do. I want to see Poochie. Come on, that's a great <laughs> how, choice. How, how, how cool is Poochie? And then, um, because we're trying to, exp- I, I gotta do. I gotta do Ray Vance because they're just yep. damn cool. They're just damn cool, and they're so ubiquitous. Specifically, the Wayfarer style. So, this has been the Mount Rushmore of cool. If you don't like our choices, mm. let us know. Go to Instagram. Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, um, Snapchat, Snapchat, Periscope. You can start a Twitter space and just talk for however long you want to about how bad our choices are. Yep, do it. We'll probably even come on. You'll probably be guests if you want to uh, go on with like one of those like weird like Russian media things. Oh like yeah, any sort of propaganda, we're fine with. Yeah, That's cool. Yeah. You know, doesn't matter. What's the Trump one? Is it still around? Or the Oh, yeah, it's called like Truth or something. Yeah. Uh, We'll see you out there. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever. Uh, uh, I as always am Jeff. I'm Richard. I'm Michael.